You are listening to the Two Disabled Dudes Podcast. I'm Kyle Bryan. And I'm Sean Bombstark. Together, we're navigating life with disability. Sean and I were both diagnosed with a rare, debilitating, life-shortening disease that has affected our physical abilities and causes us to live with urgency. We are constantly looking for the next challenge, not only in spite of our disease, but because of it. We are two dudes who constantly challenge our own abilities, and we invite you to do the same. Thank you for listening today. As you know, we've been focusing on Rare Disease Day, which is tomorrow, February 28th. And we've had some insightful and inspiring conversations over the last couple of weeks with Global Genes, the Every Life Foundation, and the National Organization for Rare Disorders. The culmination of our Rare Disease Day series is an interview with someone that is incredibly special and dear to both of us and many of our listeners. You're about to hear a little bit of our conversation with Ron Bartek, president and co-founder of the Friedrichs Ataxia Research Alliance. I say a little bit, because our conversation with Ron was so rich and insightful that we've decided to publish the whole interview in two parts. Today, you'll hear some of Ron's thoughts on Rare Disease Day, the FDA, and an exciting opportunity coming up for FARO with the FDA in June. Episode 11 will feature more of Ron, focusing on his career the launch and beginning of Farah, and more, as he shares from his heart about the entire FA and rare disease family, especially as it relates to him, his wife, and their children. We want to apologize now. This recording does have some noise clutter that was out of our control. Against the advice and counsel of our audio producer, we're still posting this. We all believe the recording is just too valuable to scrap. We hope you can listen past the audio imperfections and still draw from the content Ron shares. Let's move right along. Here is our Rare Disease Day conversation with Ron Bartek. All right, welcome back to the Two Disabled Dudes podcast. Thanks for tuning in today. Kyle and I are here with Ron Bartek, co-founder and president of the Friedrichs Taxia Research Alliance, otherwise known as FARA. Ron, thank you so much for joining us today on the Two Disabled Dudes podcast. Thank you very much, Sean and Kyle. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Ron, before we get started, I wanted to read your bio, um, just to kind of establish for the listeners who we're talking to today. So, um, Mr. Ronald Bartek is Farah's co-founder and president. He's a member of the Na- of the board of the National Organization for Rare Disorders. He's a four-year member NIH. Ad- National Advisory um, Neurological Disorders and Stroke Council, and former partner and president of a business and technology development consulting and government affairs firm. Mr. Bartek's professional experience also includes 20 years of federal executive branch and legislative branch service in defense, foreign policy, and intelligence including six years on the policy staff of the House Armed Services Committee, four years at the State Department's Bureau of Political Military Affairs, including a year as a negotiator on the U.S. delegation to the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty talks in Geneva, 
six years as a CIA analyst of political military aspects of the East-West balance, including a year as an intelligence community representative. Excuse me, jeez, I'm I'm losing my breath here. This there, is a, there's a lot there's going a lot on here. Stuff here. Who is this guy? <laughs> All right, including a year as an intelligence community representative to the inter interagency groups charged with U.S. arms control policy, and former director, American Friends of the Czech Republic. Following graduation from the United States Military Academy at West Point, Mr. Bartek spent four years as an Army officer serving as a company commander in Korea and an infantry and military intelligence officer in Vietnam. He has a master's degree in Russian area studies from Georgetown University. Ooh, wow, that's a lot of stuff, Ron. Um, and, he's, and he's barely 37. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, I think 37, right? Or 73. I, I always get those numbers confused. So. Ron, first of all, thank you for your service. We're so grateful for you and all of our military fellows who, who defend this country. Um, before we get started into rare disease, I want to talk to you a little bit about what might not be in the bio. Um, if, if anything, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Were you ever a librarian? No, I was not. And, uh, <laughs> but I, it's on I, my bucket list, so. <laughs> I know there may or may not be a few things in there. For example, I think you were a teacher, right? Right. I, I taught high school in Fairfax County, Virginia for five years. Um, and uh, I continue to say that the uh, that teaching is is still the second most important profession in the world, uh, including our own country. The first being parenting. And um, we, we need, need to do a better job of both. Um, I'd like to go back to one thing that um, was on uh, the that bio and that was the uh the nuclear arms control treaty i was very fortunate to work on i, I raise it again because um all the way back to high school i had a big dream i said wouldn't it be cool if i could somehow learn enough about the superpower relationship between the soviet union and the united states and do something in some small way that would help end that confrontation and make it more likely to be a peaceful world. And um, there I was, you know, 30 years later, uh, working every day, all day at the State Department in, in Geneva, negotiating in Russian and English with the Soviet negotiators. And, and we came up with uh, this treaty that's still in, in effect that ended two whole classes of nuclear weapons that we had based in, in Europe at five basing countries, our allies there, aimed at the Soviet Union and got rid of about 11 times as many warheads in the Soviet Union aimed at the, our European allies and our Asian allies. And those missiles are gone. You know, they're all cut up. So I always consider that um, part of the fact that very, you know, not enough of us have the opportunity to have dreams and far fewer of us get the opportunity to accomplish a, a dream, to have one come true. And that was uh, big time, a, a dream come true for me. We got that treaty, flew it back home, signed by mm. Reagan and Gorbachev, ended two whole classes of nuclear weapons in, in, in Europe and the Soviet Union. Um, and beginning almost immediately, our son Keith was diagnosed uh, shortly thereafter just a few years later, and the second great dream of my life, you know, came before me, and that one's even more important. And and I, you know, as I said, very few of us have the opportunity to form a dream, and fewer get to accomplish one. I'm a glutton for this kind of uh, wonderful uh, fruition because I'm not only have I had one dream come true, I'm Sorry, eager to that. have, you know eager to have that second more important dream come true, and that is to, to treat and cure Friedrich's ataxia. And I, like the first one, 
um, I know we're going to get it. You know, it's just no mm -hmm. longer a question of whether or if, but it's a question of when. And, and, and we're beginning to answer that question in the a very affirming positive of saying it, it won't take forever. So um, just a little uh, you know, cut back into the, the, the past there. But the, these are very important dreams for all of us now. And uh, I know we're all confident uh, that, that they're going to come true. So. This is true. That's a big dream for sure that Kyle and I share with you and probably most of our listeners do as well. Hey, be, before we uh, keep going, I do have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, Ron, the sun is behind you, so I can't really see you, but where is your microphone? Is it hanging down on the wire? Yeah, it's uh, right okay. attached to my headset. Okay. All right, cool. I'm picking up a little bit of um, uh, noise when you move. Oh, gotcha. Oh, so yeah. not that you can't move. Just be mindful of that, maybe. Okay, I'll sit uh, still. And then Kyle, <laughs> turn your phone off, you rookie. <laughs> I know. I just did. That was terrible. No, I'm still, still a great conversation so far. We can cut this little part out of me yelling at you guys. Yeah, I, I will. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna change change to a quiet chair here. You you lose the. Oh, the, hey. Now I can see you. Oh my gosh, you look great. I couldn't <laughs> see you a minute ago because the yeah. lighting. Yeah, exactly. Now uh, you won't get the lake view anymore, but uh, here we go. This will All work. right, cool. Cool. Very cool. Thanks, Ron. Are you comfortable? I you am. Be sitting there for a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good to go. This entire month and the purpose of our little series in February has been all around uh, Rare Disease Day. As you know, it's tomorrow, February 28th. Um, in, in your experience and in your work over the course of, of the years, what do you see as um, maybe the largest benefit that the rare disease day effort has contributed or created in our space over the last eight or nine years since it became a thing yeah i i'd say it um it really is um a two-way street that i would use to answer that question sean um in one direction you've got the people at the NIH and the FDA, uh, our government partners, able to uh, reach out to and um, uh, brief uh, everybody in the rare disease community. So, you know, <clears throat> one important feature of Rare Disease Day is um, uh, actually today, uh, the, uh, the 27th, um, at um, the uh, NIH, they're having their Rare Disease Day. Uh, and they, they will be talking with all the representatives that come together at the NIH on Rare Disease Day. So it's their opportunity at the NIH and the FDA to speak to all of us. Uh, the other direction of that street is that all of us are there uh, in front of the NIH, in front of the FDA, in front of our state legislatures um around the country um on various days this week um and so they're sensing i think in the one direction um our whole rare disease community is sensing the commitment and the very impressive commitment on the part of the nih and the fda to all of us in the other direction the nih and the fda and members of state legislature and national, uh, the Congress, sensing the strength and, res and um, unity of the rare disease community. And they're seeing these really are 30 million people. I mean, we're not <laughs> looking at 30 million people, but we can see these people are from all over the country representing 30 million people. These are our constituents. These are our voters. And um, so it's really a very powerful message day uh message week you know one thing that nicole Boyce said on the show a couple weeks ago she's the ceo of global genes she said part of part of their mission and 
the idea behind what they're doing is to knock on doors and to stand up on the mountaintop and say, hey, rare disease, we're here, uh, we're strong, and we're not going anywhere, so let's get this done. And yeah. you know what you said reminds me of um, that little bit that she, you know, what she shared with us not too long ago. Because you're right, it's the opportunity to stand in front of Congress or to stand on the Hill or to stand in front of anybody, the drug companies, yeah. advocates, people with deep pockets, whatever it takes, and say, yeah. we need help. We, we, we need treatments. We need cures. And we're all in this together. So what little bit can you do to yeah. help us reach the finish line. You know, I think of, of uh, any major athlete or sports team, they all have 28 different coaches or, you know, a, a different person to help hone in on this particular skill. And I'm going to help you with nutrition. I'm going to help you with speed. I'm going to help you with hitting. I'm going to help you with pitching. You know, all yeah. these different people that focus on one little area. And that's what I'm thinking about when when I listen to you talk and I hear about all these things going on in the rare disease community. We're all got a little focus, a niche focus, if you will, with the end result being treatments and cures. And if this day helps us get there, then yep. all the more days we need. Let's like Nicole said, let's make it a month. And have yeah. a rare disease month, which yeah. a lot of people, you know, like I've said, NIH is doing something today. And so many different people, we're doing something all week or all month. Yeah. So, yeah. anyway, yeah. now I'm rambling. Um, no, Sean, I'll, I'll save you there real quick because I really do like your coach, coaching analysis um, or metaphor because I it sounds from Ron like the FDA and the NIH and Capitol Hill, they're looking at the leaders in the rare disease community to be like, look, you are our coach for rare disease. Absolutely. We need yeah. you to do all this work because that's not something we can do on our own. And we're going to depend on you to coach us on rare disease. And that's part of what the rare disease community is doing is, is, filling that role of coach for rare disease. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more, Kyle. And um, I think <clears throat> there are various opportunities coming up to illustrate that point, And they're all based on the buzz now around patient-focused drug development. And listening to, I like to say, it's increasing the frequency and the volume of the patient's voice. And the mm. patient is becoming the coach. And the, there's no one um, uh, more than the FDA that recognizes the need to listen and hear the patient's voice. Because what they're uh, designing their whole operation around is um, patient-focused drug development. Uh, and they, they want to be able to have in front of them uh, that these clinical outcome measures, these clinical endpoints, these things being used to measure success or failure in a clinical trial really do relate directly to the patient's daily experience. What, how do these endpoints um, improve or fail to improve the quality of daily life for these patients? And to be able to know that, they need to hear from the patient. So the FA community, by the way, will have a tremendous opportunity coming up on June 2nd, um, this summer, uh, to uh, increase the volume and, and frequency of, of the patient's voice. The FDA has agreed um, to have us, have FARA conduct, and in collaboration with our MDA colleagues and our NAF colleagues, to conduct a, a pretty much a full day of what's called an externally led patient-focused drug development meeting. We will be assembling probably a couple hundred um, patients or patient family members, advocates um, in in the uh, the Maryland suburbs of Washington uh, on June second, and it will be live streamed um, to homes. Anybody who logs on, and 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 uh, the uh, patients and patient family members at home will be able to participate in, in um, 
in the uh, meeting itself, responding to online questions and answers. Um, so this will be a, a marvelous way, and the FDA will be there in some numbers. Um, they'll be listening to everybody in the room. There'll be like three panel presentations. There'll be a, an FA science presentation by one of our clinicians. There'll be three, three panels of patients. And, um, and then after each panel discussion of, and the discussions will be around, you know, this is what my daily life is. This, these are the things most important to me. These are the things I can and cannot do. If, if I were to have a treatment uh, for FA, this is what I would want it to treat first, sort of thing. And then after each of those panel presentations, there'll be a, um, a response period for, you know, there'll be questions up on the screen. Uh, everybody from home will be on their, uh, their own cell phones responding to the, the questions, giving their answers and so forth. And um, so it's going to be a marvelous opportunity. These will Keep in mind, these are the people that are going to be reviewing our proposals, uh, our, our clinical trial data, and so forth. Mm. So to tell them, it's so, so important to be able to tell them what's most important to us. Then our clinical trials need to address those important issues. So June 2nd, uh, keep your ears and eyes peeled. We'll, Farrell will be putting out notices and um, putting out um, guidelines and, 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 and giving all the particulars, but June 2nd is going to be a, a big day for us at the FDA. Beautiful, beautiful. Ron, uh, you know, you talk so much about the FDA. Um, you know, I think commonly the FDA is seen as the barrier. They're the people that don't allow us to you know, push treatments through or, um, it, you know, it just seems like that's a common thought that the FDA is there to keep us from, from accomplishing things. What is your experience and what, what can you speak to that sort of, um, thought? I, I, I will probably get emotional again because, uh, this is a very important issue in my view and in my heart. Um, I see, people at the FDA as people like us. I mean, these are people, you know, that didn't know anything much about FA 20 years ago. Uh, we have worked so effectively with them um, um, that they now know a great deal about FA and in, in various positions. There's an office of orphan product development there. That's the, the office that gives orphan drug designations um, awards them when, when deserved. Uh, there's an Office of Rare Diseases um, that pays attention to all rare diseases. There are then the, the review divisions uh, for neurology, for oncology, and, uh, and so forth. And then there are review divisions for biological uh, efforts like gene therapy. All those people now know um, a good bit about FA. These are people um, that now invite Farah, uh, uh, Jen Farmer, and I have any number of times given presentations uh, at their invitation at the FDA so that, that they say, you know, come and teach our reviewers how helpful a rare disease community, how helpful a, a rare disease advocacy organization can be in getting us to the finish line together. And, um, and, they, and we've even briefed their um, teams and their industry partners um, or sponsors uh, come in and who are doing clinical trials. And we've been asked to brief them on how to conduct uh, a small clinical trial in a rare disease. So bottom line, Kyle, you were there at the Rare Impact Award. You were up on stage with me um, receiving the Rare Impact Award from NORD last year. You, you could look down like I could and see probably 10 FDA people sitting together um, and our recognition of them um, was very important to them. They, they came up and said afterwards that they really appreciated uh, our description of them as being they're, they're on the same team, they're in the same family. We know, you know, I know 
these people want us to succeed. They would love nothing more than uh, for us to be able to develop the treatments and the cures for FA, uh, partly because they've come to care about our patient community, partly because they really appreciate and um, uh, the way Farah operates, that we're in the same family, we're on the same team. We know that they can't approve a drug without good data. We know that we don't want them to approve a drug that won't be safe for our patients. And that's their mandate, safe, effective drugs. And so our job, assemble the data uh, that shows that this drug is safe and effective. They will jump up and down, cheer and hug us because hmm. they want it to work for us. They, they genuinely care about us. So that's been one of the, the real benefits of our constant effort to educate our FDA colleagues and partners. That's the way we see them. They, 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 we know that they're, they're all in for us. They would like, love nothing more than to see us succeed. So. Awesome. Love that. Um, so I think that concludes my cross examination. <laughs> um, Sean, I don't, do you have anything else? No, I, it powerful. I think, uh, you do a pretty good job of carrying, covering all the details, Ron. Thank you so much for um, just hanging out with us today and talking from the heart. Well, thank you both very much for doing all this, and, and thank you both for being the wonderful, um, uh, disablingly uh, <laughs> courageous and awesome um, characters that you both are. Thank you all both for the, you know, Race Across America. Thank you for participating in clinical trials. Thank you for helping lead our whole community um, and encouraging our whole community to be such active participants in our basic research, our clinical research, and and all the FARA events. We know that FARA would not exist without you know support, you know wholehearted support from all of our families, and um, it's just an awesome. We, we a family affair now, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. no question in anybody's mind that FA research is a family affair now. And you guys are vital elements in, in not only being members of that family, but leaders of that family. So thank you both. And thank all the, the patients out there listening to you, this podcast for all that you do and, and how vital you are. You know, it's all about you. It's we're not doing this for anybody else. Mm. And, uh, and we couldn't do it without you and all that you contribute to the cause. So, thank you. Well, we really appreciate you, Mr. President. And, um, you know, we I was thinking we might get through this without a few tears. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you Never proved mind. me wrong again. And, uh, <laughs> I love it. We, we love your heart and your soul, Mr. President. And... Um, you know, we appreciate you being our fearless leader, and um, we'll we'll follow you until we get this thing done. And even now, too. I yeah. think the flip side is true. You know, people do it because of the patient, and I think this wouldn't be happening today if it wasn't for you and Rachel. So thank you for what you guys do. Thank you kindly. It's been a pleasure. Always will be. Give our best, Rachel. I know oh, we've yeah, interrupted yeah. her her afternoon with you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll get back to that. So thank you very much. All right. Bye, Ron. Bye. See you, see you soon and, and then at the finish line. So. Absolutely. All right. Bye-bye for now. Thanks, Ron. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that as much as Sean and I do. In about a month, keep your eyes open for episode 11, which will feature the rest of our conversation with Ron. It includes moving stories behind the team that launched FARA, which has grown the cause from three scientists to hundreds worldwide. Remember to share and spread awareness for Rare Disease Day, which is tomorrow the annual day that is focused on enriching the lives of the 30 million people in the U.S. and 350 million people worldwide, all who live with rare conditions that still need treatments and cures. 
as all of our Rare Disease Day guests have said, one way or another, we are making great progress on so many fronts, but we still have work to do. Thank you for listening to the Two Disabled Dudes podcast. To find this episode and links to some of the stuff we talked about today, find us online at twodisableddudes.com or subscribe on iTunes. We'd like to hear from you and feature your feedback and questions on future podcasts. Be sure to visit us at twodisableddudes.com to find our contact info and connect on social media. Special thanks to our audio producer, Jake Tompkins, who also composed the music. We'll share a new podcast every other week. We hope you'll listen and share it with a friend. Until next time, keep living with urgency.